Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to begin with a, another short word of prayer. Father and our God who art in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for the privilege of your word. Your word, O Lord, and the entering into giveth light and understanding. Father, I ask for wisdom and understanding this evening for myself and for my brethren that are gathered here with me. Lord, as we look into your word, help us, dear God, to see Jesus. Father, there are so many different truths, so many precious truths in your word, but it is present truth that your children need at this time. I ask that you will grant us the eye salve that Jesus applies alone, and I pray, Father, that you will hide me even now in the cleft of the rock, my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good evening, and it's still preparation day uh, from where I am, but happy Sabbath to those of you where the sun has set. Um, this evening, we're going to be picking up from our last study. I was unable to join you a few weeks ago. I wasn't feeling well, but by the grace of God, I'm feeling perfectly fine today, and we are going to pick up uh, right where we left off. The subject title for this evening, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. 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 Amen. The, the subject for this evening is entitled, We Are Well Able in Him. That is Christ. We are well able in Christ. That is the subject for this evening. Before I begin with the message, I want to share with you a, a, um, a testimony that I had heard one time. There was a man who delivered mail. He was a, he was a postman. And the man delivered mail every day on different routes. But there was this one particular house where he would bring uh, mail and they owned a, a very large dog. I believe it was a, a pit bull or a mastiff or something like that, Some, a very big dog. And the, the mailman, for, 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 for all the courage that he could muster, couldn't seem to get the mail to the doorstep because every time he came to deliver the mail, the dog would run and it would bark and it would cause all of this noise. And, you know, just the sheer size of the dog and the, the muscles on the dog was enough to, to petrify the man. He was scared. So the man never delivered the mail to the front of the doorpost where he was supposed to. One day, the man came to deliver the same mail to the same house and he saw the dog and he took off running in the opposite direction. But as the man was running in the opposite direction, he stopped in his tracks and he thought to himself, he said, wait a minute. I am made in the God. I am a man, that is a beast, I have dominion, I'm not running anymore. So the man decided he was going to stand his ground, he was going to fulfill his commission, he was going to fulfill his job. So the man goes back now, opens the gate, the dog is right there waiting for him, big as he always was, strong as he always was, barking and loud as he always was. And as the man got closer to the gate to deliver the mail, he took a close look at the dog that he was running from all that time. And do you know what he found? The same dog, big as it was strong as it was, loud as it was, terrifying as it was to the man, the dog had no teeth, beloved. So the man was running from this dog all this time for fear because he did not understand that which he feared had no teeth with which it could harm him. Beloved, I'm beginning this message this way because I want us to understand something about Satan this evening. I want us to understand that in light of all that God has done for you and I in Christ Jesus, we are dealing with a defeated foe when Satan comes to us. I'm going to say it again because I want us to really understand. Don't take what I'm saying for being foolish and not understanding that the adversary with which we have to deal is powerful. I know Satan is powerful. What I'm saying is the God whom we serve is much more powerful than the adversary we face. Every time Satan comes to us, I don't care what temptation it may be, what your struggle may be, what your weakness may, may be, there is blood enough in Christ to cleanse. There is power enough in Jesus to overcome. There is much more grace than there ever will be sin. Much more grace to save us from sin than there is power in sin to contaminate us. Satan, sin, self, all of these adversaries, beloved, before Jesus, our righteousness, are as dogs without teeth. 
And so again, the beginning of this message, I want us to understand the title does not say we are able in him. It does not say that. It says we are well able in him. In the same way, the Bible does not say where sin abounds, grace abounds. It says where sin abounds, grace did much more abounds. The Bible does not call you and I, beloved, to be to have victory over sin, and that's it. No, the Bible says in Christ we are more than conquerors. In other words, victory over sin is only the beginning. God has so much in store for us if we understand the God with whom we are dealing. We're going to be talking about the man Christ Jesus, beloved. We're going to be talking about our Savior, not just the dying lamb. No, 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 beloved. You see, a dying lamb is wonderful. Do you understand that when you study the Bible, a dead Christ is more powerful than a living Satan? A dead Christ is more powerful than a living Satan. Was it not by the cross that he destroyed he who had all of the power of death? Was it not through the cross that he liberated every man? You see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Beloved, a dead Christ is much more powerful than a living Satan. But I came here this evening to let you know and to reaffirm, we serve not a dead Christ, but a living priest in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Beloved, we are well able to overcome in Christ Jesus. And the subtopic is understanding what God has done. I believe it is impossible for you and I as God's people to do anything in regard to the work, finishing the work, whatever it is we think we're doing, we can do nothing except we first take a moment and evaluate what God has done. Everything he does initiates and begins everything that we can do. Now, I want to begin by recapping where we were in our last study. In our last study, uh, just recapping it, the Bible showed us that God expects perfection of his children. I'm going to say that again. The Bible showed us that God expects perfection of his children. Let's reaffirm this from the word of God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, the Bible said, Be ye therefore what? Perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, beloved, I don't get into debates about the Greek and the Hebrew and what perfection and this perfection and that perfection. No, I believe in biblical perfection. When the Bible says that we are to be perfect and we ask the question, what does perfection mean? We simply need to look back at the same text. It says, be ye therefore perfect. What does that mean? Even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. We took a look at Psalms chapter, I believe it's 145 and verse 17, where the Bible said that God is holy and righteous in all his ways. Everything about God is righteous, and he is calling us to the same experience. Now, let me say from the onset that when we're reading words like this, be ye therefore perfect, some of us may shrink away from the task because, Lord, do you understand that I am but dust? Do you not realize how long I have failed in my profession as a Christian? Lord, I teach people to love others, but I've yet to get over that evil thing that that person did to me way back there. Lord, I teach people to forgive their enemies, and yet I hold a grudge like none other. How can you ask me to be perfect? Beloved, the same God that says, be ye perfect, do we not understand it is the same Jesus that said, let there be light? When God said the words, let there be light, we have to understand this. There was no light prior to the word going forth. But when the word went forth, beloved, though there was nothing but darkness before, the word of God creates the reality. Though you are imperfect in and of yourself, when the word of God comes to you and says, be ye therefore perfect, there is enabling gospel creative power to make that the reality concerning you and I. Now, my question is not whether or not we are perfect, but whether or not we believe what God has said. And by the grace of God, let, let the conversation end there, because I, I, have, I have literally been in positions where I have preached the Bible alone from the pulpit, and the very ministers who had called me to preach are arguing with me on this very point. We cannot be perfect, though the Bible says we. Beloved, let our faith be not on what man says, but what on the word of God says. It doesn't matter what their title is. It doesn't matter how many years of schooling. The word of God is the, is, is the, uh, it's the common man's book. 
It is a book that when even Pharisees and priests reject what God says, the fisherman can understand, the construction man can understand, the farmer can understand. Beloved, we can understand this thing if we take it as it reads. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father is. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 16, the Bible says, all scripture. How much scripture? All scripture. That means Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books. Every single one and every page is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, catch this, may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I heard uh, Brother Hudson read this text just a moment ago. Beloved, this scripture right here tells us that the very purpose of the Bible the very purpose of all scripture is that the man of God may finally be perfect. So when we have ministers and lay preachers and all these various people who don't believe in biblical perfection, you might as well put the Bible on the shelf. Because anything you can quote to me from the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is for this one purpose, that God may have a people that are finally perfected. We were created in his image, and the plan of redemption is to restore that image in us. God has no sin in him, beloved. And thus God is seeking a church that reflects his sinless, perfect, lovely image. During our last study, we took a look at this uh, covering cherub here. His name is Lucifer. The Bible said in Ezekiel chapter 28, concerning Lucifer, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Catch this concerning Lucifer, the Bible said. Thou wast perfect. What was Lucifer, beloved? He was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until what? Iniquity was found in thee. During our last study, we saw that perfection and iniquity are antagonistic experiences. You cannot claim that you are living biblical perfection and be in a state of sin. Sin and perfection are literally biblical opposites in the personal experience. So when God says, be ye therefore perfect, can we not see it is a creative call, an enabling call to the believer out of all sin. I'm giving you Bible, beloved. I'm giving you Bible. There's going to be plenty of uh, spirit of prophecy references, but just from the last study, I'm sure many of you realize from now that when, I, when we're looking into the Bible, we want to have a sure foundation from the Bible. There are many people out there who believe that as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, most of us in here, they, they believe that uh, Seventh-day Adventists are, are founded upon the writings of Sister, Sister Ellen G. White. Respectfully, Sister Ellen G. White is my sister. I stand beside her as the true prophet of God in these last days, beloved. But if Sister White were alive today, she would tell every Seventh-day Adventist that reads her writings, you'd better understand from the Bible that that which the prophet is speaking is in fact from the Bible. We have to know that we know what is the truth. We have to understand this, beloved. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that is, he died on Calvary. For what purpose? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. How? By the word. That same creative word, beloved. By the word. That he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be what? Holy and without blemish. Can a church be holy and sinful simultaneously, my friends? No. If God is calling us to biblical perfection, he is calling us out of iniquity by his creative word. If God is calling us to acknowledge his sacrifice, we have to realize that Christ died for a purpose, that he might sanctify and cleanse the church. The reason why Christ has not yet returned is because while the sacrifice is paid, while the cleansing power is available today, the people who claim the savior are still slaves to the sinful experience that Jesus purchased liberation from. Beloved, God has a victory for us, and we're going to see this in a short moment. In our last study, we took a look at this picture on the screen on the bottom left. It says, not every place that you fit in is where you belong. You see, that tangerine does not belong in the midst of garlic cloves. It is the right shape, 
but is the wrong substance. It has a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. In the same way, in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, we saw that Christ went to prepare a place for us in heaven, meaning that Jesus is seeking to make you and I belong to the heavenly kingdom, not just by shape, not just by profession, not just by denominational name, but by nature. God is seeking to make us partakers of the divine nature so that when heaven comes to earth by the grace of God, we fit in to the heavenly atmosphere. Beloved, I promise you, if we're not learning now to enjoy heavenly food, you're not gonna enjoy uh, being by the river of life. Some of us still like to fish. If we're not enjoying heavenly music now, we're not going to enjoy when, when the angels in heaven are, are, are singing and we certainly won't join in the chorus. We need to be cleansed this side of eternity so that we can spend eternity with Christ where he is. And finally, in Revelation chapter 22, the Bible said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that, not here, beloved, catch this, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now that's interesting because many of our uh, Christian brethren out in the world, they preach that if you're teaching others to obey the law of God, you are teaching bondage. But the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates. Do we know that if we're not commandment keepers, it is impossible to enter into the city? The question is not, if we should keep God's law, beloved, the question is, how are we to keep it? Because there's one way to look at God's law that is in fact legalism. And there is another way to look at God's law that is biblical, that is true, that is the experience of justification by faith. And we're going to get there in a moment. Now, what does inspiration have to say on God's expectations under grace. We just saw from the Bible that God expects uh, perfection. Perfection and iniquity don't go together. So in other words, he's looking for a victorious generation, those who are walking in his commandments, living righteously. But somebody may say, well, you know, that was then, but we are under grace now. So God does not expect that. I want us to see something from the thoughts of the Mount of Blessing, page 76, paragraph two. We are told the conditions of eternal life under grace are just what they were in Eden. <clears throat> Excuse me. Perfect righteousness, harmony with God, perfect conformity to the principles of his law. The standard of character presented in the Old Testament is the same that is presented in the New Testament. I love this, this sentence right here. It says, this standard Perfect righteousness, perfect conformity, this standard is not one to which we cannot attain. I'll say it another way. This standard is one that we may, by the grace of God, attain. It says in every commandment or injunction that God gives, there is a promise, the most positive, underlying the command. God has made provision that we may become like unto him and he, key word, beloved, please catch these words. He, that is God, not you and I, he will accomplish this for all who do not interpose a perverse will and thus frustrate his grace. So inspiration says that the purpose of grace is God's accomplishment of perfect righteousness in you and I. The purpose of grace, according to inspiration, is God's accomplishment of perfect righteousness, perfect conformity to the principles of God's law in you and I. The only question you should have on your mind right now is, does the Bible agree? I believe that we're living in a generation where, as Seventh-day Adventists and others who are listening, we need to get to a place where, if we believe it, we must be able to prove it from the Bible. So, you, you see... We're not always going to find ourselves in, in uh, predicaments where we're dealing with, uh, with those of like faith. So we have to know what the Bible says. What does the Bible say on this matter? On the purpose of biblical grace, follow me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, beloved? God 
forbid. Notice the wording of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, shall we continue in sin that the grace uh, that grace may abound? He didn't say Paul forbid. He said God forbid. That is not God's purpose. What is God's purpose then? He says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? For sin shall not have dominion over you. Beloved, that's that toothless dog once again. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why not, uh, Apostle Paul? He says, because you are not under the law, but you are under what? Grace. Whoa, 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 whoa. Beloved, I need you to catch this because there are many ministers out there today who don't understand what we just read. The Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over you. And it gives for the reason of that, that you are under grace. So you mean to tell me, biblically from Romans 6, 1 through 2 and 14, that the purpose of biblical grace is not to give us a license to continue in sin, no, but it is to be an enablement, an enabling power so that sin shall not have dominion over us. That is Bible, beloved. Grace is not a license to sin. It is the power to live victoriously. If sin does not have dominion over those who are under grace, then those who are truly under grace have dominion over sin. Those who are truly under grace have dominion over sin, or as we say as Seventh-day Adventists, victory over sin. Now, somebody may be saying, Brother Paul, that, 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 that's troubling because I, I may have read something else somewhere in the Bible. Well, let's continue. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, speaking of grace yet again, the Apostle Paul said, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to how many men? All men. Doing what, beloved? Keywords, teaching us. I want us to pay close attention to what the Bible is saying here. The Bible says the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. There are many in the Christian world today who accept that first line. The grace of God brings salvation and it's appeared to all men. All men are saved by grace through faith. Amen. Continue the text. The Bible says that same grace of God has a, has a function. There's something it does if you really have it. It says teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. What is the next word? Righteously. Psalm 119, verse 172, thy commandments are righteousness. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly when in this present world. There are those today who believe that grace has nothing to do with us living a righteous life this side of the second coming of Jesus. Beloved, the Bible says we should do so in this present world and that grace would teach us to do so. The reason Christ has yet to come to receive his church is because his church claimed the savior. We claim to be saved by grace, but the lesson that grace was designed to teach us, we have failed to learn. How do we know that we have failed to learn the lesson of grace? How do we know that we have failed to learn the lesson of living righteously? Well, very simply, are you living righteously? Am I living righteously? Are we living according to the lesson that grace has come to teach us? Beloved, if we have not, I am thankful by the grace of God that today probation is not yet closed. Today, there is enough blood to cleanse us. Today, there is enough enabling uh, grace to lift us up and to make us walk as God desires us to walk. Beloved, God would never ask you to do something that you did not have the power to do. And if he did, you can be sure that the asking was the giving of the power. I'll say that again. God would never ask you to do something you did not have the power to do. And if he did, the asking was the giving of the power to do so. When God says, go and sin no more, the fact that he has said so is why, by his grace, we can do so. Beloved, I need us to understand this thing clearly. Because it's righteousness by faith all throughout, from beginning to end, Genesis through Revelation. God saves his people by this same enabling grace that gives us the ability to live a life of dominion over sin, teaching us to live righteously. I wanna continue in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. The Bible says, let us hear the conclusion 
of the whole matter. Now, I trust God with the conclusion of the whole matter. I'm not going to debate with ministers and, and various people and brethren. The Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Sounds like the first angel's message, does it not? Fear God and do what? Keep his commandments. Now, why should I do that, Lord? For this is the whole duty of man. Beloved, the Bible says that man was created to keep the commandments of God. We're going to understand what that means in, in a little moment. We were created to keep the commandments of God. We were created to reflect his image, his character to all of the universe. That is why we were created. Any man that teaches us we cannot have victory over sin is teaching us we cannot live up to, by the grace of God, the purpose of our creation. You might as well teach us that we came from monkeys, beloved. I need you to catch what I'm saying. We were created for the purpose of keeping the commandments of God so that his character, his image, could be seen by all who are watching. Any minister, any lay person, any brethren that teaches us that we cannot live a victorious life by the overwhelming power of Christ is telling us that we cannot live up to the purpose for our creation, even by the grace of God. And if that is the thought process that we have accepted, we might as well teach our brethren that we came from monkeys because it goes right along with evolution. The purpose of our creation, beloved, was the keeping of God's commandments. We are made in his image for that purpose. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, I'll give Jesus the final word on this point. Jesus said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill. Everything the law says Jesus was. Oh, beloved, I need you to catch this. Everything that the law says Jesus was. So when God is calling us to commandment keeping, can you not see he's calling us to Christ likeness? Isn't that the, 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 the epitome of Christendom? Isn't that what it means to be a Christian? How can you call yourself a Christian if you don't follow Christ? And the same Christ we profess to follow fulfilled the law. Beloved, if we receive the man, Christ Jesus, then that same law can and will be fulfilled in us. The Bible says it is God, not you and I. It is God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, not merely to hope that someday we'll be Christians, not merely to hope that someday in the future we'll be perfect, but to actually live that way. That is the work of God in you and I when we accept biblical grace. I'm going to use terms like this over and over. Every time you see me by the grace of God, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use terms like that. Biblical grace. I don't care for what type of grace we have out there. If it's not biblical, it's not for me. Because the only one that works, beloved, is that which is from the Bible. Biblical grace to give us dominion over sin. Jesus said, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all these things be fulfilled. Jesus said, until heaven and earth pass, are you sitting on earth right now? If you're not, beloved, you're gonna have to let me know where you're located because that's a very interesting uh, theory you have there. We are all on earth. Heaven still remains. Not one jot or tittle has passed from the law of God until all things be fulfilled. This is the word of God. I want us to understand the question now. I believe we've made the point from the Bible. The question now isn't if we should keep that law. That's not the question. The question is how, because as Christians, we, we, we've wanted to for all this time, seven at Venice especially, we've wanted to for all this time, but if we're honest with ourselves, have we kept the Sabbath as we ought? Have we honored our mothers and our fathers as we ought? Have we loved our neighbors? Have we loved God with all that we are? Beloved, the answer, if we're being honest with ourselves, I'm going to be gracious with the answer. The answer is there is much room for improvement. Amen? There is much room for improvement. Jesus is not interested in leaving you at the spiritual level that you're at now. He wants to take us higher and higher. Every round on Jacob's ladder goes higher and higher. Now, I, I want us to understand something. Let me give an example. The Sabbath. As Seventh-day Adventists, the son has even said even now, Father, we thank you for your Sabbath day. Abide with us and grant us rest. In Jesus' name, amen. The Sabbath, beloved, is a commandment that as Seventh-day Adventists, we have taught for years, since uh, since the 1800s, we've been teaching our, our, our people, teaching our children, uh, the strangers that are within our gates, all of these people we have been teaching about the Sabbath. My question is, do we realize that there is no Sabbath keeping until Christ is given his place in the Sabbath? 
What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I want us to catch this, beloved, because there are many of us who are going to church on Saturday, but we've yet to keep the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Don't, don't misunderstand what Brother Paul is saying. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That is Bible. What I am saying is if we're going to church on the right day, but we're not in communion with the right person, then the day is obsolete. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. That word rest meant Sabbath. Jesus said that you don't keep the Sabbath to, 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 as, a, as an effort to make me and you be one. You don't keep the Sabbath to come to me. The Sabbath and the keeping of the Sabbath is an evidence that we've already come to Christ. No man can truly keep the Sabbath except he first come to Christ. Christ is not in the outer court. Christ is not in the holy place. Christ is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary as of October 22nd, 1844. Beloved, I'm going to make these things plainer by God's grace and by the word of God alone as we continue going forward. What I need us to understand is everything about the law that God expects of you and I, God will perfect and fulfill in you and I if we do not interpose by our own perverse will and frustrate his enabling grace. I want us to learn a lesson from biblical history. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. I want us to learn a lesson from biblical history. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. Now, all these things, speaking of ancient Israel, happened unto them for, keyword, and samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The Bible says that the history of ancient Israel was written unto us as in samples. It doesn't say examples. It says end samples. Those are two different words. The word example means something you may follow. The word end sample means that it is a literal type. It is a pattern. It is a shadow. That which you're seeing then will be repeated in our present day. If you're studying the history of ancient Israel, you'll find many parallels between what's going on at that time and what is going on in modern Israel today with God's church. Now, I want us to see something that the Lord commanded ancient Israel, because if we understand what God commanded and how Israel responded to the commandment, we will see a pattern being repeated in these last days, a pattern that is necessary to be understood if we are to have the victory, beloved. In the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verses 1 through 2, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may, number one, search the land of Canaan, number two, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. Beloved, please. I pray we're paying attention here. What did God command Moses? He said, send thou men, number one, that they may search. Amen? The land of Canaan. And the second thing he said, which I not am giving, but which I give unto the children of Israel. When God gave this commandment to Moses, the land of Canaan was as good as Israel's because the Lord wasn't giving it to them. The Lord said, I give present tense. If they had heard the commandment of God and received it in the present tense by faith, do you understand that Canaan would have been theirs from that very day? Beloved, I want us to understand. Uh, you'll remember in the book of uh, Genesis, God gave a specific command to Adam and Adam taught his wife Eve. He said, that tree of knowledge of good and evil, you can eat of every tree in the garden. Don't eat, keyword, don't eat from that one tree. That's what God said. But in Genesis chapter three, you'll see that when the serpent came to Eve and the serpent uh, uh, began to inquire as to what God had said, Eve said to the serpent, we must not eat and we must not touch. God never said anything about touching the fruit. We have to pay close attention to what God says, because if we miss what God says and add anything to what God has said, Satan will trip us up, even if our, uh, uh, our motives are right. When Eve said, we must not eat and we must not touch of the fruit, there's no scripture in the Bible that, that, that shows us that God said that. But when Eve said that, I believe with all of my heart, her, her intentions were good. Her intentions were good. But had she just repeated uh, uh, what the Lord had said, we shall not eat, she would have been well off. 
In fact, if, if you're listening and you're, and you're studious, then you know uh, the best the best thing she could have done was to run and find her husband rather than to uh, enter into converse with the serpent. She should have never spoken with the serpent. But the, the point that I'm making here is when we add anything to the Lord's word upon that very point, Satan will, will, will catch us. Now, God told Moses, send men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto chil the children of Israel. That's all he said. God didn't ask Israel to plan out how they were going to conquer. God didn't ask them to count uh, 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 all of the uh, various obstacles that they would have along the way. God didn't ask them to do any of that. He said, go and see. Now, any of you who are studying righteousness by faith, we know that in a very simple, uh, simple terminology, the message of the gospel is look and live. It's the same thing that he's giving to Israel back here in Numbers chapter 13. He said, go and search, go and look. But an evil report and a faithful report resulted from what God had said. Follow on. In the book of Numbers chapter 13, the Bible says, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. So they did what God said for 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land, whither thou sentest us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Now, beloved, if the report had ended there, we could all say, praise God, amen. But that's not where the story ended. It said, nevertheless, they continue, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Did God ask them about the strength of these men? And the cities are walled. Did God ask them how tall and how walled the cities were? And very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites, follow this, beloved. There's a reason I have it in bold. It says the Amalekites do what? Dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites do what? Dwell in the mountains. Beloved, I need us to see this. And the Canaanites do what? Dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Stop there for a moment. God told them to go and see the land that he is giving to them. If anything, seeing how high the walls were, how great the walls were, uh, how strong the people were that dwelled in the land, and how the, the children of Amalek and, uh, and Anak and Amorites, seeing all of that should have done nothing but increase their faith. Because if you see all of those obstacles and God says, I give this to you, whoa, we're getting ready to see a miracle. That should be the way we think. But that was not the way these men were thinking. They saw the obstacles in the same way that Peter saw the waves on that water when he was walking on it. And the moment they saw it, just as Peter, they began to sink or they began to fall, beloved. We can only walk by faith. It's interesting how they mentioned the Amalekites dwell, the Amorites dwell, the Canaanites dwell, but they forgot that God said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Is not the God we serve greater than the enemies without? Is not God greater than your temptation, greater than your sin, greater than that evil that that person did to you in your past? Is not there more power in Jesus to overcome? That is the question of this evening, beloved, whether or not we believe that. Because in ancient Israel, every obstacle that they saw for these men was the reason why they didn't enter into Canaan. I ask you this evening, is there any sin in your life that you can point to that is more powerful than the grace and the blood of Christ? Is there any obstacle you can think of? Is there any person that has hurt you so bad? That the forgiveness that God has had towards you cannot work forgiveness in your heart towards them. Is there anything that your husband, that your wife, that your children can do can, that can separate them from your love when you cannot separate yourself from the love of God? Beloved, what are we beholding? Because only by beholding do we become changed. If we're beholding the Amalekites that dwell, the Canaanites that dwell, the Amorites that dwell, and we're not beholding the living priest, Jesus Christ, who dwells in us, we're going to give an unfaithful report. We're going to fail to live a victorious life. And we're going to be discouraged and become a discouragement to those who are onlooking. Beloved, there are those who are watching us. They hear what we profess to believe. And they're just waiting to see if there's enough power in what we say, what we're talking about. If there's power in this thing, let me see it. But our marriages look exactly the same as the world. Our children grow up in the exact same way that the world does. 
the music is the same, the education is the same, the preaching is the same, our style of worship is the same. Where is the clear distinction? I'm thankful that the word of God said that this is an ensample. It means that th there are those among us that are having that experience. But there were two men. Praise God, beloved. You know, God likes to send them two by two. Uh, in 1888, God sent two men by the name of A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. If you don't know those names, you're going to get very familiar with them as we spend time together. But God had two men at that time, too. The Bible says, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses. That means he told them to be quiet. And he said, let us go up at once right now and possess it for we are well able to do what overcome it beloved this is the language of faith this is a christian caleb said let us go up at once did caleb not see all of these various obstacles that these other spies saw caleb saw all of that but the difference between caleb and these other spies was Caleb knew who dwelled among them, and these spies only recognized who dwelled in the enemy's territory. Beloved, we need to focus on Jesus. We need to focus on our faithful high priest. He is faithful. Faithful is he that has called us. He will finish it, beloved. He will do it. I don't care what your experience looks like tonight. Jesus is able to take you to another level even this evening if we would just accept it by faith. It says, but the men that went up with him, that is the other spies, said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Now, hold on, beloved. That's a blatant lie. Did these same men not two verses ago say that the land was flowing with milk and honey, just as God said, and now the same men with the same tongue want to say that it's, an, it's a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof? Beloved, is it milk and honey or is it quicksand? Which is it? They said, and all the people that, that we saw in it are men of a great stature, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Enoch, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so we were in their sight beloved there's only one thing i agree with these men on if you're not a grasshopper in your own sight this evening you have no chance against this uh, against the devil if you're not a grasshopper in your own sight this evening if you don't recognize your weakness there is no hope for you to overcome the devil but if you know that you are but a grasshopper if you know that you are small and that you are weak and that you are defective but you lean upon a better arm Yea, the everlasting arms of Jesus. Beloved, there's power in him to make you more powerful than all the hosts of Satan. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us do what? Return unto Egypt. Can you imagine that? 400 years of slavery and you see a couple of giants and you're willing to run back to 400 years of slavery again. God have mercy. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Japun, uh, Japune, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. They tore their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us then he will bring us into this land and he will do what? Give it to us. Notice Caleb and Joshua weren't trying to figure out how the battle would be won. Caleb and Joshua realized the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. So it doesn't matter how high the wall is. Somebody says perfection is too high of a wall. How am I supposed to get over that? If God has called you to it, beloved, it is God that is going to bring you through it. Do you believe it? If the Lord delights in us, the Bible says, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not you against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Caleb and Joshua understood that when you're dealing with the enemies of the gospel, when you're dealing with the obstacles to the victory that God has promised you, victory over sin, beloved. Every obstacle is as a dog without teeth. It cannot harm you if you lean upon Jesus. Jesus is our only hope. It's okay to see that you're weak. But remember his promise that his, it is in our weakness that his strength is made perfect. 
Now that was to show you the report uh, that was to show you the command of God to ancient Israel back then. God said, go and search the land. He didn't ask them to, 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 to tally up how strong they were in comparison. to God didn't ask them to do any of that. What is the command that God has given to you and I in our generation? What is our command and how are we relating to it? We're closing. How are we relating to the command that God has given us? In Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, stand fast. First two words, beloved. Seven of Venice, we know that God gave the third angel's message for the purpose of preparing people not to sit, not to fall, but to stand. The Bible says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath, keyword, made us free. The Bible does not say, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ will make you free, or Christ is making you free. It says, wherewith Christ hath already made us free. And be not entangled again. To say be not entangled again is to say that Christ has already detangled the problem. Let me repeat that, beloved, because I don't want this to go over anybody's head. I want us to catch these things because we're preparing ourselves for further studies where we're going to go deeper. And if we don't understand the, uh, the, the, the sure foundation that is being laid right now, we're going to have questions then that could be answered even now. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, stand. That's what God said. God said, stand. God didn't say, go and figure out how to get the victory yourself. He didn't say, go and do this and do this and do this and do this. And as a result of you doing all of these things, you would have victory. No, he said, stand. I have done something for you. Do you know what I have done? If you knew what I have done, you would believe what I have done and you would stand in what I have done. And I would do it again through you by faith. The Bible says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty that is victory, freedom, wherewith Christ hath made us free. My question is, do we understand the truth? Beloved, if you and I are seeking to do something to make ourselves victorious, we'll never be able to obey the command of God to stand fast. It's the same thing as, as counting all the obstacles. The Amorites and the wall is high and, and we've been here for such and such amount of years and, 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 and there are this many seven events and we need to reach it. We're going to be calculating all these things when God said, listen, I am the divine. I am the wonderful number. Leave the calculations to me. I know where I am sending you. I know the obstacles in your way and I have removed all of them. We're going to prove this from the Bible, that any obstacle you can biblically bring before the cross, God has broken down every single one. I don't care if it's the carnal mind. We're going to see that. I don't care if it's the sinful flesh. We're going to see that. I don't care if it's temptation. We're going to see that. Everything that we can possibly give as an excuse to why we don't live a victorious life, Jesus <laughs> has overcome not only for us, but as us, beloved, I know that for, for some of you, the wording that I'm using may not make sense yet, but as we follow on, these things are going to become more and more clear. I want us to stop on this, this last slide here. Here's where we're going we're gonna to conclude the study for tonight. Now, beloved, the, the name of the subject, again, is we are well able in him. But I should have told you from the very beginning that this is only part one to this study. This is not, this is not an exhaustive study. There are many questions I'm sure we have, and there are many questions that we should have, and the Bible is going to unfold all of these questions, and when we get back together again, we're going to pick up right from where we left off. We're, we're ending the message tonight on the question, why did Jesus have to die? Now, why are we even asking that question? Why are we asking it? Because the last question we asked was, do we understand the victory? The Bible calls us to stand in the victory that God has already made us free by. If we're going to stand in a freedom that Christ has already, has already accomplished for us, we have to understand where that victory came from. The Bible says, be not entangled again. Somebody says, but I'm entangled right now in the yoke of bondage. Right now, I'm entangled in sin. So how can the Bible be calling me to not be entangled again as though I was detangled? Because God has done something, beloved, that has detangled the very problem you're struggling with right now. God has done something in Christ for you that if you would see it and receive it and believe it tonight, you could stand in the liberty where Christ has made us free. When we talk about preparing a people to stand, beloved, when we talk about preparing a people to stand, we must understand the victory that Christ has wrought for you and I, because it's the only liberty in which we can stand. Any other liberty is not worth trying to even stand by, beloved. It won't make you stand. But if you understand what God has done from the Bible, Jesus is able to make us stand. 
So the question now, as we begin to understand the victory that Christ has wrought, the first question we have to ask is why did Jesus have to die? The Bible says in Romans chapter six, beginning at verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want us to see this. In order for us to see the first part, we must see the second. The Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life. Now, when the Bible says the gift is of God, it means that eternal life came from who? God. Eternal life is the gift of God. Eternal life and God are inseparable. You cannot get eternal life without God. God would not give you but eternal life. That is the gift that he gives. Now, another thing I want us to understand about that word gift, the fact that eternal life is a gift automatically disqualifies anything you and I think we're doing to earn it. A gift is not earned, beloved. It's given upon the merit of love. We're given the gift because the person loves us. It's not because we've earned it. It couldn't be a gift otherwise. But wages, beloved, on the other hand, is something earned, is it not? When you, when you go to work and you, and you receive your paycheck or whatever the case may be, those are your wages. The wages are the income or the monetary, however you want to look at it. It is you receiving that which you have earned. You reap and you sow. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. I want us to see something. The Bible said the gift of God was eternal life, but the wages of sin is death. Do we understand that death is of sin? Do we understand that death is of sin? Now, what do I mean by that? When we talk about the wages of sin being death, it means that death is not a wage that God required. It is the wage that sin required. In other words, death is the price that sin demanded. Many of us may not be understanding what I'm saying right now. I'm going to say it again, because many of us, the only reason why we continue in sin is because we think sin is somehow a, a friend of ours. We, we don't recognize the danger in sin. I, I, I'll say it this way. Sin is as a grenade. We all know what a grenade is. It's a bomb, right? A grenade. Sin is as a grenade with the pin removed. Now, if any of you know what a grenade does when the pin is removed, beloved, you understand that the grenade without the pin is very very dangerous. I don't want to be near a grenade with the pin in it, much less a grenade without the pin. Sin is as a grenade with the pin removed, and we have been running around since Eden with this thing in our hands. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Christ came into this world not simply to put the pin back into the grenade. That could not be done. He came to take the grenade from you and I and to suffer the eternal penalty for, him, uh, for you and I by himself that you and I would have a second chance at life because of what he has done. Beloved, the wages of sin is death. The price that sin demands is death. James uh, speaks on this too. It says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is what? Finished, bringeth forth death. Beloved, there's so much in that text. But I, I, I'll digress to the to the last the, the latter half of it. Sin, when it is what finished, bringeth forth death. Now, the automatic conclusion that we come to here is that sin brings death. Sin brings death. Sin has a plus one. We all know what a plus one is. When you're going somewhere and you're invited somewhere and they, they say you have a plus one, it means you can bring this additional person with you. Well, when you and I permit sin to stay in our lives and refuse to give it to Christ, the inevitable result, the plus one of sin is death. And we're talking about eternal death, beloved. But the Bible said right there in the middle, sin when it is finished. The question is, what was sin doing before it finished? Anything that finishes started and was doing something all throughout. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Okay, we see the conclusion, but what was sin doing before it brought death? Sin was destroying families, beloved. Sin was destroying and robbing people of health. Sin was breaking up marriages. Sin was causing uh, uh, murder and, and, and adultery and all types of crime. All of these evil things that we see going on in this world, pandemics and, and et cetera, and et cetera, are the result of us living in a sinful world. But when sin is finished with us, when sin has run its course, the end result is always death. 
Now I'm saying all of this, not to say that Christ died because he was a sinner. We know very clearly from the word of God that he was the spotless lamb of God from the day he left the throne and to the day he returned. Never did Christ commit sin. Amen. Never did Christ commit sin. He did not die for some sin he committed, but he died for the sins which you and I have committed. The Bible says, speaking on that point, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Jesus, and with his stripes we are healed. Beloved, we talk about the ministry of healing. With his stripes, we are healed, and we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. Catch that. We have turned every one of us to his own way. But the Bible says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Jesus says, I am the way. So Christ in the sanctuary is, oh, beloved, this is the redemption plan we're talking about here. It says, we have turned everyone to his own way. Christ in the sanctuary returns us to the way of God. And the Lord hath laid upon Jesus the iniquity of how many? Us all. Very important point, beloved. God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Now, if the wages of sin is death, if sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, then what type of death touches the individual upon whom all iniquity is laid? Beloved, we, we don't understand what happened on Calvary, you know. Many of us think it was just an awful weekend. Beloved, Jesus suffered an eternal punishment on behalf of you and I on that cross. We're going to understand this more and more as we get into our, uh, our studies. And our final question here is, what is God's relation to death? What is God's relation to death, beloved? The Bible says, the last keyword, enemy, that shall be destroyed is death. What is death to God, beloved? An enemy. The Bible says the Lord takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. The wicked shall be destroyed. This is biblical fact. I'm not going to debate that with anybody. The, the wicked shall be destroyed. That's biblical fact. But death is the enemy of God. Sin is the enemy of God. Sin is the enemy of you and I. So long as we hold on to sin, beloved, we are in danger and Christ died. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people, not in their sin, not in their law uh, transgression, not in their commandment breaking, but from that very thing. John chapter 1 and verse 29, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Beloved, we're going to cap it off right here for this evening. I see that it is now 916. We're going to cap it off right here for this evening. But I want us to understand we need to dive deeper into the understanding of what happened on Calvary. Because if we understand the liberty that is there for us, we, by the grace of God, will finally be able to stand. That is the very purpose of the giving of the third angel's message, to prepare a people to stand true to God, to get us this experience of victory over sin, which is righteousness by faith. Again, I know that there are many things that I may have said that, that, that there are questions about, and we'll get to that in a moment, um, but we will be delving into this even more in our future studies. I'm going to close here with a word of prayer at this time. Father and our God who art in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for the clarity of your word. Lord, we know that if there are questions that we have, your word is where we will go for the answers. I'm thankful, dear God, that we ought not to guess at anything but that you have an answer for everything that we have. Lord, the gospel is the wonderful simplifier of our problems in this life. Lord, simplify this thing for us. Give us Jesus. Abide with us, we pray, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.